Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Project Sovereign. I'm Alex Hickman, uh, your host today, and I am with Tom Campbell, who has been uh, an enormous influence in my life. I must admit, he's a, Tom is a physicist, uh, an author, and a consciousness researcher. Tom, thank you very much for joining me. It's, uh, it's an honor. Well, thank you, Alex. Uh, I'm glad to be here. I first saw you, Tom, in uh, it was Manchester, England. I think it probably three or four years ago now at the university. I think mm -hmm. um, I read your my big toe, uh, and then I, I went up to Manchester and uh, caught the train up there to to see you in person. So thank you for that. Um, as, I, as I recall, catching a train that particular day was uh, kind of problematic, wasn't that? In it, the middle of a big snowstorm. It was indeed. Yes, it was. I come from all the way from London up to Manchester. Yeah. It was a three or four hour ride. It was uh, well worth it anyway. Thank you. Uh, Tom, let me ask you a question to start off with. Um, how did you get into the study of consciousness to begin with? Because obviously you're a physicist. Generally speaking, do they go hand in hand? Um, well, no, generally speaking, they do not. They're pretty much opposite things. People in science tend to stay away from consciousness because consciousness is the realm of the subjective and physics is the realm of the objective. So those two don't, uh, don't mix and match very often. Mm -hmm. But I had, a, I had an experience when I was in graduate school working on my, my doctorate. And that was I, I learned how to meditate, transcendental meditation, and found out that from a meditation state, and this was only after about three months of doing transcendental meditation, I found out that I could debug my computer code in that mental state so much more effectively and efficiently than I could actually physically going and looking at the, looking at the code, trying to find out you know, what was wrong with it. Mm. So that told me that <clears throat> there was more to reality than just the physical because this was entirely mental. It was not physical. There was no way that this should have been able to take place, but it did. Mm. And I, it's not like I just did it once and it was a, a strange one-off. I could do it whenever I liked. And I did all the way through, you know, graduate school. It was easy for me to, to find errors in code. And at that time, that was a very big deal. Now we have all sorts of debugging software and other things that make it almost trivial. But then it was a very, very difficult thing to do and took lots of hours and, and was a, a major um, kind of bottleneck that you had to get through, get through when you were doing scientific work and you needed to rely on a computer. So anyway, that's, that was the first thing that got me, the physicist, into thinking about consciousness. You know, physics is basically a study of reality. You know, how does the world work? And up until then, I had what's called an operational definition. And that is if anything that's real must be able to be operated on. Measurement is an operation. You must be able to measure it. That's an operation. Because if you can't measure it, if you can't interact with it in any way physically, then, you know, what is it? It's not physical. Well, if it's not physical, then physics really doesn't have anything to say about it. It's not science. It's not... Uh, it's not even real, you know, it's mostly hallucination and, and uh, yeah. you know, mental quirks and that sort of thing. So when I learned to do that with my mind, debug code, and I just would see the, the printout of all the code. I just see the printout flowing by me, like scrolling by me and, and uh, an error would be in red. That line would be in, in red and I just stop it and rewind it and look wow. at it. And because I wrote all the code, I was very familiar with every line of it. So I could look and say, oh, okay, I see what's wrong with that. And, you know, this was back in the days when, when code was written on punch cards and put in big, long boxes and so <laughs> on. So it was really a tough thing to do. So anyway, uh, so then I realized that there was more to reality than just what you could physically interact with. There were things you could mentally interact with that were also just as real, just as reliable, just as consistent, you know, just as accurate. Mm. They just weren't interact. You couldn't interact with them physically, but you could interact with them mentally. So now I had this mental world as another whole part of reality that physics really didn't say anything about. 
So I was very, very curious being a physicist that wants to understand reality. It's like suddenly, uh, instead of me thinking that I knew how the world worked, I realized there was a whole lot of the world that I had no idea how it worked. And then within a couple of years, I got out of graduate school, took a job, and uh, through some people I associated with at work, I, I met Bob Monroe, yeah. who had at that time written one book, which was Journeys Out of the Body. And Bob Monroe was putting together a, a laboratory to study consciousness because he was a, his personality was really more engineer than businessman. He was a businessman. He was wealthy. Mm. He lived on a, on a, you know, a very, you know, the big house on the hill kind of estate with the whiteboard fence and the horses and all of that. So he was a, he was a wealthy uh, country gentleman, mm. uh, owned and operated uh, a cable uh, business and he was the only cable company in town so business was good that was in the very early days of cable 1970 you know late 1960s early 1970s so cable was just being introduced then and he was right up in the front of it so he was a very successful businessman and he wanted that out of out of body phenomena that it just happened to him nothing he tried to do but it just happened to him he wanted to make it scientific. He wanted to make it real. He wanted to find out what is it, you know, how does it work? Mm. So he set up this laboratory because he had the funds to do that sort of thing. And uh, I volunteered. So that's how a nice physicist like me ended up in a place like this talking about consciousness. Because I realized that, you know, my interest was studying reality. And reality was a lot bigger than just physics. Mm. There was another whole part to it. So I started working with Bob. And the deal was that, you know, I'd be uh, one of his scientists for free and he would teach me to do what he did. He would try to explain to me and show me how to experience this larger, this larger reality system in which he got around in. So he did. So for the next, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight years, I spent 15, 20 hours a week with Bob Monroe and in the lab and him teaching me and me trying to figure out how things worked. And so it just uh, went on like that. Eventually, Bob's work got to be so popular that it was in my part in it switched from researcher to trainer nice. because so many people wanted to, wanted to experience the technology that uh, we had developed that helped put people in really good meditation state to, to, so they could experience this larger system of reality. And then I kind of slipped out the back, became a member of the board of advisors, I think, of, of uh, at that time, it turned into the Monroe Institute, TMI. When I first worked with Bob, there was no TMI, you know, and, and uh, the TMI came out of the fact that it became so popular. He had so many people wanted to experience uh, the larger reality. So then I started working on my own, kept doing research, and about... 35 years later, thought that I understood it well enough to write something down. So I started the, the My Big Toe trilogy, and it was to be primarily a book about consciousness, kind of a theory of consciousness. But I had also known during that time that consciousness was, was fundamental, and the physical was not. The physical was derived from consciousness. I knew that because I and many other people could do things from within consciousness that would affect the physical world. But you couldn't do anything in the physical world that, that directly changed consciousness. So that made consciousness the more fundamental of the two. So causality ran from consciousness to the physical, not the other way. So the consciousness was not a creation of the physical, but rather the physical was a creation of consciousness. Mm. So when I wrote the theory of consciousness, I knew that that was going to be also the fundamental place where you'd have to start to describe physics, that physics was contained there. So it wasn't until about a couple of years after I'd published those books that it actually came to me, you know, in an aha moment, exactly how that would work. <clears throat> you know, how did it describe physics? And then I realized that I could take those same principles that describe consciousness and I could derive quantum mechanics from first principles. 
and answer the big mysterious question in quantum mechanics is that why should particles be best described in physics as probability distributions? Because physics has known for almost 100 years that particles are really probability distributions. Mm -hmm. They're not little hard chunks of mass you know, with, or char with charges or whatever. They're probability distributions. And that's the only way you can compute the right answers. By right answers, I mean the answers you get in experiments. You know, that's the only way that the theory can match with what's measured. So that's the big mystery. That's, you hear quantum mechanics called weird physics, weird science. Well, that's the weird part. Particles are probability distributions. That's mm. pretty weird. And this allowed me to derive that first principles of why that had to be true, why it couldn't be any other way than that. And then I looked at um, relativity, which is the other big, you know, you know, big monster in physics besides uh, quantum physics. And the big mystery there was why is the speed of light a constant? Nothing else works that way. There's nothing that just has constant velocity. See, no matter how fast the source of the light is going, the light that comes off the, from that source is still going exactly the same speed. And everything else, that doesn't work that way. So it's just a big mystery. Why should light always travel at exactly the same speed? It can't, you know, it can be zero or it can be C, the speed of light. Mm -hmm. But it can't be anything in between. It's, you know, it's, it's just like that. So in any case... Uh, then I, I realized that uh, my model derived exactly why C had to be a constant and why that is, why it couldn't be any other way. So then I started looking for the other paradoxes in physics, you know, things that physicists know are true because the experiments say these are true. You know, it, the world does work this way, but we have no idea why, mm -hmm. what the underlying causes are. And I found that I could solve all of those paradoxes. And all one needs to solve them was just a different point of view. And that is that the reality is not primarily physical. It's primarily information. Mm. And science is coming to that now. Uh, that's been uh, probably a, a, uh, the latest big surge in new understanding in physics departments all over the world is that reality appears to be information-based, not matter-based. What that means is that reality is computed or is computable, okay? So reality seems to be a simulation or a virtual reality and that this world is information-based. So that's kind of how a physicist ended up doing consciousness research and how in the end they turned out to be kind of the same thing. You know, I, yeah. could, I could do better physics from my understanding of consciousness. It, so, so uh, did you, so Tom, did you derive from that, that reality is uh, a subjective thing rather than objective? Yes, reality is a subjective thing. Everything is really basically subjective. Now, what we call objective are those things that inherently have very small uncertainties. You see, if the uncertainty is small, then we say it's objective. Like take a, take a brick. If you just have a brick, you know, and we measure it, you know, how, what's its length, what's its width, what's its height, how much does it weigh, what's its volume, yeah. we, can, we can measure all those things, but we can't measure it exactly. We can only measure it approximately. We'll get to a point that the measurement is only capable of so much accuracy. So the length is, you know, and we may give it a length. And it may have six decimal points or seven or eight decimal points if we're using lasers and x-rays and other kinds of very fine measurements. But eventually it's, well, it's this length plus or minus this much error. You see, there's always some measurement error involved. Measurements can only measure so much. So we don't know exactly what its length and width and height and, you know, weight, you know, what its mass is. We don't know. Only we know within, well, it's no, much, it's no more than this and probably no less than that. Mm. So you see, that's not really objective. That's probabilistic. We know it within a certain probability of it being within a certain range. And that's it. So nothing is really objective in that it's absolutely fixed. And there, everything has some uncertainty. 
associated with it. But that uncertainty is small. It's so small that we just assume that it's objective because it's close enough. You know, the fact that that brick, it's, uh, say, mass varies in the 10th decimal place doesn't really matter in our world. You know, in our macro world, that's irrelevant. So we say that brick is an objective thing. It's a brick. Look, it's right there. It's this, has this much volume, has this much weight. And all of those are actually just statistical averages. They're not really exact values. So everything really depends on some guesswork, some mental work, you know, approximations made in mind, in mind space. So those people who measure it, if their equipment is really good to 10 decimal places, well, when they get to that 11th decimal place, they're just guessing. Mm -hmm. It's a little bigger, you know, and it's okay. It's maybe that last decimal place is a nine, not a three, because it seems to be a little bigger, but we can't really measure that. So we're guessing. So everything has some, some uh, what do we call it, uh, guesswork, some, you know, a mind, a consciousness somewhere is making approximations as to what it is. Well, that's what we call, you know, things that are subjective. They're subjective because there's a lot of uncertainty about whether it is really that way or not, you know. So we look at things that are subjective, like uh, justice and love and, you know, empathy and caring and compassion, all those things are very subjective. Mm -hmm. And uh, even good and evil, you know, they're, they're, they're subjective for the most part. So yeah. we have all this subjective stuff going on. And that's because we can't define any of those things. We can't make a hard definition that everybody says, yeah, that's it. That's it. Exactly. Yeah. There's a lot of disagreement. There's a lot of uncertainty of exactly what those things are. So things that have rather large uncertainty, we say are subjective. And things that have very little uncertainty are things that are objective. Mm. But basically, everything, if you want to get really picky into detail, everything is subjective. So, okay. yeah, that's how that thing, that uh, objective subjective uh, yeah. works out. I mean, is science's limitations uh, sitting within the, the fact that they uh, want to measure the objective world? Is that, pri is that their primary limitation now, do you think? And do you think we're actually transcending that through quantum physics and, and things like that? Yes, absolutely. Um, physics has, has uh, painted itself in a corner, so to speak. Um, it's put itself in a, in, a, in a region of intellectual space where the answer doesn't exist. Yeah, you know, it it tries to understand, you know, why do things work that way? You know, why should particles be probability distributions? Why is the speed of light a constant? Uh, why do these quantum mechanics experience, you know, experiments keep working out this way? And they don't really know. And they've painted themselves in a corner that doesn't contain the answer because from Newton on, science has been materialistic. Newton. It's, it's often referred to as the great clockwork universe. You know, the universe is a big machine. It just works like a big clock. And if you knew, you know, how that clock worked and all the gears and wheels and levers and everything that was in this big machine, if you knew about all of that, then you could predict from then on everything that would happen because it's just a machine. There is no free will you have determination. Physicists tend to be determinists. Uh, so they got stuck in materialism and determinism all 100 years ago, and they haven't been able to dig their way out of it yet. Yeah. So that's a problem. Like we were talking about, physics says, oh, we don't work with consciousness because that's subjective and, and we're not. Yet there's a lot of science there. There's a lot of things about consciousness we need to understand. And yes, uh, uh, neuroscience works on things like that, but they're very much hindered by the concept that this is a material reality. So they think that consciousness is created by the brain. So they think it has a physical source, and it doesn't. 
and they can't find it. And it's been elusive and it just doesn't seem to exist. And that's because it doesn't. Consciousness is something else. It's not created by the body. In fact, this virtual reality in where there is a human being with a, you know, with, with a brain, that's all a uh, virtual reality created by consciousness. So it's just the opposite way around. They call that um, the hard problem. That is the, you know, where does consciousness come from? How does consciousness come out of a human body? And they have no clue. And they, they don't, they won't get a clue because it doesn't <laughs> come out of the human body. But see that limit. So now you have neuroscientists who can only call themselves scientists if they can make their studies of consciousness be based on physical things. So there's not much they can do. They can probe the brain and say, well, this little part of the brain goes with speech and this part goes with seeing and this part goes with, uh, you know, attitudes yeah. toward one, you know, with fight or flight or they can do that sort of thing. You know, they can make lists and show what affects what, but they can't do much more than, you know, do maps like that. Yeah. Well, the reason that uh, that map exists is that in a virtual reality, you know, our bodies are the avatars. Consciousness is the player. Okay. Well, the avatar is a representative of the rule set of the game. The rule set in this game is physics, chemistry, you know, biology, all the things that science digs out. Science tries to find out what are the rules mm -hmm. in the rule set in this, this virtual reality. So the, the avatar, us, our physical body, uh, has to abide by the rule sets of the game. So the rule set then is a constraint on what consciousness can do, what the player can do with its avatar. So yes, if there's somebody and they have an accident and get hit in the head and have brain damage or a stroke, let's say, then maybe they can't speak, maybe they slur their words, maybe they can't walk very well, you know, maybe they lose their memory. Well, that means that the damage to the avatar changes, adds constraints to what the conscious can do, you know, with that, with that uh, avatar. Yeah. And it's the same way in our virtual reality games. You know, your, your character in World of Warcraft uh, falls off a cliff and lands on stones at the bottom. Well, now you can't, there's, you know, you have, you have things you can't do with that character anymore, yeah. at least for a while. You know, there's, there's limitations because his, what, hit points went down, uh, you know, other things happen to him, so then the player has to play a debilitated character. And that's the way it is here. So um, when you try to, uh, you know, if you're the elf and you try to figure out, you know, how it is hitting that cliff, you know, causes these, these you know, the damage, well, that's, that's physics. You know, you can figure out that, but from the elf's viewpoint, you know, the elf lives in a physical world and everything that happens to the elf, you know, makes sense as far as the elf's concerned. Yeah, yeah. And it looks at the rules, say, what are the rules? Well, elves can't fly, you know, they're by flapping their arms, but some kind of creatures can fly in World of Warcraft, but elves can't. So there's just rules that have to be followed. And, and where is the, where is the um, virtual reality being computed from? Well, someplace outside of that virtual reality. It can't be computed inside the virtual reality because you know, virtual reality doesn't compute itself. Mm -hmm. So it has to be computed. So from the elf's point of view, the server that serves up that reality has to be non-physical to that elf and exist outside of the virtual reality. And the player has to be non-physical and outside of the virtual reality. So what does that mean about us? If this is a virtual reality and our body's the avatar, that means consciousness is the player. And another part of the larger conscious system that can configure itself as a computer you know, is the computer. So consciousness serves both as the player and the computer. And I just call that the larger consciousness system. It's an information system. Consciousness is about information. Conscious of what? What, what are you aware of as consciousness? And awareness basically means you're taking in information. 
and you can process that information and you can come to some sort of conclusions about that information and then you can look for different information or modify that thing. So it's a self-modifying system that has memory, that has, uh, you know, sensory, you know, awareness, gets data, processes, and it also has to have a purpose. That way, you know, evolution needs criteria that define what's the difference between evolution and de-evolution, you know, then there's criteria, you mean. In this physical world, that criteria is survival and procreation. If you're good at survival and procreation, well, then you keep evolving. If you're not good at that, then you'll eventually become extinct. So with consciousness, um, the purpose is creating information, and that can be reduced down to lowering entropy. Start with an information system with all random bits, and that's very high entropy and no information. But as you order those bits in meaningful ways, that creates information. So a, a information system evolves by lowering its entropy. And so that sets the purpose. And then from then on, it just evolves to keep lowering that entropy. Because just like everything else, you either evolve or you de-evolve. And if you de-evolve too much, you disappear. You so as a, human, as a human being, Tom, what would that look like? in terms of low in entropy, would that be becoming more soft natured? Yes. Well, let's make a little um, a comparison there. What does that mean? Uh, first, you have to realize that, that uh, being a human being, you're part of a social system. You know, and it's just, you know, humans, that's just part of their nature. They interact with other humans. They, they can work together, they can cooperate, they can build cities, you know, they can, they can uh, uh, write down knowledge and yeah. expand on it. So they're a, they're a social system. In any social system, and, and consciousness is like that, consciousness itself is a social system. It's a lot of individuated units of consciousness that are interacting with each other. Okay, and many of those are players in this game. So in this virtual reality game, uh, this game is just a an entropy reduction trainer for individuated units of consciousness. Okay, so if you have a, a, a two sets of um, individuated units of consciousness, you know, set A and set B, and I'm going to break these down into, I'm going to give each one a name. One will be the love group and the other will be the fear group. That is, one set of these individuated units of consciousness will be full of fear. They'll be fearful. And the other one will be love. They will care about others. So that's another way of looking at it. The love group cares about other. That's the definition of love. If it's love, it's about other. The fear group is very self-centered. It's about self. What about me and mine? Um, so if we take those two groups, give each one of them the same amount of resources, and let them go see what they can do with those resources. Say so put 100,000 people in each of these big petri dishes, right? That's an environment. And we're going to let one of them, the other, they're identical, except one group is very fearful, the other group is not. One group is self-centered, the other group is not. And we give them a certain amount of resources to both groups, and then we just let them go interact and see what that social system builds. Well, in the fear group, there's no trust, because if you're fearful, then everybody might take advantage of you. So there's very little trust. If you come across a really good idea or, or make an invention, well, you keep it to yourself because you could sell it or you could, uh, you know, rent it or you could somehow get value out of it for yourself. So you, you would come up with a structure like a patent office, which would make sure that you get the benefit from that. Um, when, uh, with that fear group, you'll find that it'll start to clump up into subgroups that are like mutual defense groups because otherwise the bigger and the stronger can just take stuff away from the smaller and the weaker because that's the way it is in a fear group. No trust and basically it's only about self. So if you happen to be a big strong self and you find a, a weak self someplace that has something you want, well, you just take it away from them. So now the, they start to group up 
So now there's 10 or 20 of them together. Now it's hard to take something away from 10 or 20 because there's, there's a lot of them. So then you have, then that group starts to bully other people that aren't in a group. So other groups form and pretty soon you have a social condition or a social organization that let's just say is, is um, exemplified by the word uh, warlords. You end up with a whole bunch of, of groups, all of them to the idea of mutual defense, but they're also offense. They also take each other's stuff, take each other's land, take each other's resources. And there's constant fighting within groups, constant fighting between groups. And groups like that are very stratified, very hierarchical. So you end up eventually with, you know, what, 5% of the people owning 95% of the resources and everybody else is a peasant. You know, everybody else just does what they're told down at the bottom of it. So that's kind of where we live. That sounds a whole lot like our reality. You know, it's basically has been a warlord mentality up until maybe the last 500 years or so have we started as a, as a species to break out of this war more warlord mentality a little bit. It's still a lot like still that. There. Yeah, yeah. You know, even even if you go down not the not the countries, but just to say a corporation, it's still mostly a warlord mentality. You have the boss, and the boss tells, you know, the the vice you know the vice presidents what to do, and they tell all the directors what to do, and the directors tell all the division heads what to do, and so on. And it's this very deep hierarchical, you know, thing with the peasants at the bottom that uh, basically do what they're told and don't get much, you know, they, they have marginal lives. So that's, that's the fear group. Now over in the love group, that's a group where it's all about other. So they tend to organize things because they want everybody else to have, you know, kind of whatever they want. They want everybody to be happy. They want everybody to, to uh, share and do what it is they want to do. So if there somebody gets a good idea, well, they share it. Everybody can share that good idea. They don't want to sell it. They want to share it. And if there's only so many things to eat, well, they share them. You know, so it's a, it's a place not with a tyranny of the majority. It's not like that. But everybody in the group would like most that every, that every other individual in the group gets what they want and is able to do what they want to do. So you have maximum free will choice, you have maximum opportunities. So if what you're doing is something that you'd like to change, oh, I'm a brain surgeon and I do brain surgery every day of the week, but I'm feeling weak and puny because I, all I do is that and I never get any exercise. So I'd really like to you know, do something else, do something outside, something physical, something that would keep my health up physically. All right, well, I can do brain surgery Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and I can ride on the back of a garbage truck Tuesdays and Thursdays, you know, lifting heavy garbage cans and dumping them into the trunk. And that way I'll be physically fit and robust and actually have a healthier mental attitude <laughs> toward life. Mm. So you can do that. Or if you just want to write poetry, well, say, eh, I'm tired of working in this job. I just want to write poetry. I want to do something else. The system will try to reconfigure itself so you can write poetry. Yeah. Because that also is valuable. You see, so the system tries as much as it can to let everybody do what they want to do, to develop themselves in any way they want to develop themselves. Mm. So that's the difference. So now let's say that we let these two systems go. And, you know, 100 years later, we go back and see, see what they've done, what they've built. Well, again, you'll see the love system has optimized itself maximum opportunity and free will for everybody. The fear system is basically a warlord mentality, very hierarchical, with a very few people at the top with most all the resources and a very large number of people at the bottom living very marginal lives. That's the two. So now if you look at those, where, which is the high entropy and which is the low entropy? Now, you know, high entropy is high disorder, high dysfunction. You know, inefficient, all of that goes to the high entropy. So we see the, the, the high entropy side, 
is uh, like where we live. The low entropy side is all full of caring, consideration, cooperation, um, empathy, you know, that sort of thing. Mm. So it has optimized the resources and the learning and the knowledge as best it can for everybody. So that says that the when the consciousness system lowers its entropy, you know, I said that's its purpose, that's where it's going, that means it's moving toward becoming love. It's moving toward becoming cooperative and caring yeah. and letting go of self-centeredness. So that's the evolution of consciousness is heading in that direction. And what role, does, what, what role does pain and suffering within the human being play in that? Well, if you, you know, if you uh, play in this game, this virtual reality game we call physical, you know, we call physical reality. If you play in this game, and if you, if you, uh, what I call increase the quality of your consciousness or lower your entropy, you'll find life is very happy. Life is good. Life is full of joy. Life is optimized. It's maximum, and. In as much as you don't, in as much as you are full of fear, uh, ego, you know, self-centered, full of belief, then your life is very suboptimal, and typically you'll feel a lot of pain, dissatisfaction, unhappiness, misery, unsatisfied, you know, all those negative things. So basically, those, those negative feelings are your feedback. You're not doing so well. You know, in this game, you know, we're, we're playing a game called consciousness evolution by making choices here in this virtual reality. And if you're not making very good choices, you're making choices to the side of fear, then your life is going to be unpleasant. So you can look at that unpleasantness as the feedback you're getting for, you know, how am I doing? How am I doing in the simulation? <clears throat> uh, so yeah. that's, that's where the fear and the unhappiness and that comes from for the most part that's the you know that's the big that's the big level yeah. now also there's a lot of random things going on you know because we've got a lot of, of players in this game and they're very interactive so everything that you know some you know anything let's say that i do affects other people and those other people then maybe will change what they do or what they think or how they do something because of what i do so I drive my car into the garage to have work on it. And now that affects somebody who does mechanical work. Now they've got a job to do. So I give them money. Now they have money to spend. So, you know, everybody affects everybody else. Yeah. So that's what it means to be a social animal. Yeah. You know, to have community is that we're all interactive with each other. And when you have that many people interacting with each other, we, you know, there's a lot of just stuff happens. <laughs> it's not planned. It just happens because this happened, made that happen, which made this other thing happen. And now that may affect a hundred people in some way, you know? So that stuff is just stuff you deal with. And what's important isn't the stuff that happens, but how you deal with it. You see? So if you're in that fear group, what's important to you is what happens. You try to manipulate what happens in your life to be it the way you want it. You're constantly trying to get life, to force life, to push things, to manipulate things, to be the way you want them to be. And that's a struggle. So your life is a constant struggle. And it never is quite the way you want it to be because there's so many other people that you know, are on their own struggle, wanting life to be the way they want it to be. Yeah. So it's very difficult where if uh, you know, you're a low entropy person, then it's not about fixing things or changing things to be the way that you want them, it's stuff happens and you interact with that stuff with the most loving, caring and cooperative choice you can. In other words, a low entropy choice. So you try to make the low entropy choice, which is the caring choice. And if you make low entropy choices, then you are evolving because that's the name of the game is lowering your entropy. That's the forward direction of evolution within consciousness. So if you're, if you're, what, winning the game, if you're at least uh, improving yourself, you know, leveling up, as they say, in, uh, in uh, uh, gameplay, virtual yeah. reality games, if you're leveling up, then that's good. 
and you'll probably be a pretty happy camper. Stuff happens and you just deal with it. And sometimes the stuff is hard. Sometimes the stuff hurts, but that's okay because you see it as a growth opportunity. You see it as a, as a way to make a really good decision. So you don't sit around and, and wallow around in self-pity. Oh no, why, you know, why me? Oh, woe is me. You just, you chug along and you still smile because you're learning and you're growing and life is going on and you're still a happy camper. So that's the difference. So people who uh, have negative feelings, if you ever have, if you ever feel anger, if you ever feel even stress, if you, if you feel a dissatisfaction, if you're upset, if you feel like you're not appreciated, if you feel like you're not getting your fair share, you know, all of that stuff is negative, then that's because you have fear, ego, and beliefs. Ego and beliefs are really products of fear. Yeah. So that's the way that works. And if you are a high quality consciousness or a low entropy consciousness, and you are uh, successfully evolving, then basically you find joy and positive things. You tend to be a very positive person and you can enjoy um, your life even under very suboptimal conditions. Even if you find yourself in a world like ours that's still mainly, uh, you know, warlord mentality, and you find people trying to take advantage of you and ripping you off at every turn, that's okay. It's just where you live and it's the way those people are and they're doing the best they can with what they've got and you accept that mm. and you still smile, you're still happy and you still find joy in life. So that's the, that's the difference. Yeah. I mean, I, I tend to find that cause I work with, uh, you know, a few clients and stuff and I tend to find that the ones who uh, try and alter life as it is, uh, they try and like mold it to their version of reality. That is the, the ones who suffer the most stress, have the most anxiety, Right. Uh, depression and all that stuff. Um, I said, just have you ever just tried letting go of all that stuff just for 10 minutes and seeing if you feel any different? And uh, you just tend to feel a cloud just come off them. Yes, indeed. And if you can do that for your whole life rather than just 10 minutes, yeah. then uh, you, you start living in a, in a place of joy all the time. And, and annoying people and difficult things don't upset you. You just accept them. They, they are because that's the way they are. Yeah. And you try to, you know, if you can be helpful to that situation, you should, but if you can't, then you have to, you know, accept what you can't control and that's okay. So yes, that's, that's true. People who uh, try to force reality to be the way they want it, typically end up with a reality that's just the opposite. That's almost never the way yeah. they want it. Yeah. They, they, they create what they fear. What they fear is that, that they will be left behind. They won't be properly rewarded. They won't be cared for. They won't be loved. The people won't like them. They've got all this fear about the negative stuff that maybe they're not good enough or not adequate enough, or they're not, other people don't realize the gifts and, things that they bring and they're not being used appropriately and they've got all this negative. And if you have all that fear, then you will create a reality in which all that stuff comes true. You will create a reality that manifests your fears. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you have a lot of positive things in your mind, you manifest a world that, that is positive. So that's, yeah, that's why people who are trying to, to uh, control things. You know, they want to control their children. They want their children to grow up and become, you know, doctors and lawyers or this and that. They don't want their children to do other things. They, they need to be this way and that way. They control each other, their spouses. They want their spouse to be this way and not that way. They want to control the people at work. They want to control the boss. They want to control everything in their life to be the way they want it to be. And they're miserable yeah. because all those people have free will and they're going to be however they are. And if that's not suitable to you, then you're just going to be unhappy. So that's okay. you, know. you tend to find the people who are really authentic within themselves, who like it doesn't matter what's said to them or what circumstance happens to them, there's never any defense mechanism to that 
Right, it just is. It just rolls yeah. off them, yeah. It's just like it doesn't affect them one iota. No, because they don't take everything personally. So if somebody comes up and is rude to them, they don't immediately take that as an attack on them. You know, they don't take it personally. Mm. It doesn't mean anything about them. All it, all it says is something about the attacker. It tells them a lot about the attacker. It doesn't tell them anything about them. Mm. You see, so they realize that it's not personal, whereas people who are very fearful and have a lot of ego and beliefs, then almost anything that happens, they take it personally. It's about them. It was an insult about them, and now they get angry, and now they have to push back, and so on. So then their life is full of struggle because everything is about them. Well, that's the nature of being self-centered. When you're self-centered, it's all about you. You know, that's basic, you know, that's the basic definition of being self-centered. Everything's about you. Yeah. So if somebody says something rude, well, you know, they just have wounded you, you know, it's all about you. Not that they're just having a hard day and they're all messed up and they're full of fear and whatever, and they're just expressing their own misery. Yeah. You know, it's not about you at all. It's about them. Yeah, yeah. That's a very evolved view on life though, right? There's not many people who can actually step away from a situation and have that conclusion to uh, an event that happens mm -hmm. there. It's quite an evolved person that can take that. Yeah, it, that's unusual. Yeah, I call this, this uh, physical universe the, a uh, virtual reality trainer. Yeah. You know, and it's a virtual reality trainer to uh, help consciousness lower its entropy. You know, that's what it is. And uh, this, this trainer is basically populated by people of pretty low quality of consciousness. Fear is the way we are. I mean, we recognize ourselves as the, the warlord mentality, right? Whether it's in the corporation or in, the, in a family or wherever it is, you know, we have uh, that control, power, force is the basic ethic of, of, uh, of a warlord mentality. It's all about control, power, force. Who can control who? Who can get their way? Mm -hmm. And that, uh, that's a very dysfunctional place to be. But that's where most of us are. So the great majority of human beings walking around, no matter where they live or what country they're in or, or uh, what race they are, they are fairly low quality of consciousness in the sense that it's, we are control, power, and force oriented. Our life is like that. Our businesses are like that. Our relationships are like that. You know, everything we do is basically control, power, force is the underlying theme of everything. So yes, most people then are unhappy. Most people feel stress and difficulty and anger and all of those negative things. They feel it every day. They live in that kind of an environment. So yes, somebody who actually is, lives in a joyful environment, uh, even though it's the same environment, they both live in the same town in the same place, you see, they both make to have the same salary, you know, everything's the same about them. But uh, if one of them is full of fear and the other one is not, then one of them's happy and having a good life and the other one's miserable. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's just the way it is. And, so, and so having a lot of stuff doesn't make you happy. No, gosh, no. It makes you worse from my experience. You worried about yeah. this and stuff and uh, some more stuff going on in my mind, making sure that money was another one. Uh, if you have m the more money, the more money I was worried about losing. So it's just like, uh, yeah, well, money, money buys you control, power and force. Mm. You see, so you can take those control, power and force ethics that you have. And you can, you can push on those even harder, you got more control, more power, more force, more yeah. ways to control other people, more ways to con <laughs> you know, control everyone. So it just if you have a lot of resources that can lead you to de-evolution because it puts the accentuation on control power force, mm -hmm. but money itself isn't the problem. It's the low quality of consciousness. That's yeah. the problem. Mm -hmm. You can have a lot of money and have a very high quality of consciousness as well. You know, so it's, it's not the, it's not the money that's really, well, they say money's the root of all evil, but it's not the money. It's the quality of the people 
Yeah, sure. And that is the that is the key. And you can be very poor and live in a very, very simple condition, and you can be either way. You can have a high quality of consciousness and, and be a very happy person, mm. and you can be very miserable. Mm. If you have, if you're a low quality of consciousness, then you feel a lot of self pity and misery and anger at other people who have more than you do. But if you're a high quality of consciousness, then you just get by and everything's fine. Mm. And you love the people around you and they love you and you get along just fine and you eat when you can eat and everything is all right. And you're still positive. You still have fun. You still laugh and life is good, even if it's extremely hard. So it's you know, the, the amount of resources you can develop is not the key point. It's the, it's, it's the quality of the person. It's the attitude. So as a collective species in this reality, do you think we're like in nursery? Yes, we're, yeah, we're, we're, yeah, you say nursery. Yeah, we're like, you know, daycare, uh, mm -hmm. you know, elementary school. You know, I say this is a big schoolhouse for, you know, training um, for evolving consciousness. So we're in this schoolhouse where we're supposed to make these choices. And the reason we have this virtual reality is because if we're just units of consciousness without a virtual reality like this, well, all we can do is just communicate to each other. You know, we can just, it's like being in a big chat room. There's very little traction there on growing up because there's very little that has consequences. There's very little that really has a lot of meaning to it. It's just chit chat, you know, and, and uh, it, there's not a lot of significance. So you created a virtual reality with a rule set that's real tight. And now everything anybody does affects other people. And suddenly you have a lot of choices that have very strong consequences, life and death consequences. It's very uh, important. Yeah. Um, every choice you make is an important choice with consequences. So then this virtual reality becomes a fast track to consciousness evolution. If you're a individuated unit of consciousness, you want to log on to an avatar in this game because this is the place where you get to make those important choices and have the potential for growing up, for evolving positively. So, 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 so yeah. when, what, what's your theory of when we pass on, uh, do, do we go to a more evolved or less entropy reality based on how we live here? Not really. Mostly, well, I just uh, let me just trace through a, a, a typical cycle here. Sure. Uh, we have consciousness that logs that logs on and plays an avatar. Okay, we already kind of stated that part. Now that avatar grows old and the avatar dies. When the avatar dies, that that uh, consciousness doesn't die. Consciousness is immortal. So we as players, as consciousness, are basically immortal. Our avatar dies, just like in a virtual reality game, you know, World of Warcraft, your elf is always dying. And uh, he's always losing fights and getting eaten by monsters. And you know, you resurrect him and you go back in the game. Well, that's the way it works here, too. Because you're not going to be able to grow up much, which causes growing up is lowering your entropy, you're not going to do that to a great degree, in just one life experience, it's hard to do. You do that by changing who you are by getting rid of fear, not such an easy thing to do. So what happens is that when your character you're playing, your avatar, your physical body dies, you, the consciousness, then well, think about, well, I've got another avatar because I've got different, you know, I got more things to learn. And you'll think about it a while, you'll, you'll try to get a character that will work for you. You try to get a situation that will work for you. <clears throat> and then you get back in the game. You log on to another avatar, <clears throat> excuse me, but you just bring along with you only your quality of consciousness. Okay. You just bring along with you when you log on with just your quality of consciousness, no memory. So actually the way, you know, it makes it a little more complicated, but let me go through it again. You have 
<coughs> an individuated unit of consciousness. That's a piece of consciousness. It takes a part of itself, which I call the free will awareness unit. Just it, uh, you know, takes just a piece, a subset yeah. of itself, and puts in a partition. You know, we can talk like you know computer science lingo. You know, it'll partition off a piece of itself, and that partitioned off piece only represents the quality of that individual unit of consciousness. There's no memory, and that then logs on. And it makes all the choices for that character, for that avatar. So it may log on while that avatar is still in utero because it can hear mom and dad's voices and get some sound and some light, you know, through and it can, uh, uh, you know, get connected a little bit in that way. Or it could log on after birth. You know, it's, there's, there's no fixed place where it has to log on. It logs on whenever there's sufficient <coughs> input for it to to uh, sense. So <coughs> it logs on, and because it comes with no memory, every experience that that avatar has, that say that baby in your in utero has, that is the only experience that that free will awareness unit has. So the free will awareness unit is only aware of the experiences of its avatar. So it has, <coughs> it has a tendency to identify with the avatar. Right. So <coughs> that's why we, we human beings, we identify <coughs> with our avatar, even though we are pieces of consciousness because we're only a subset of that consciousness that doesn't have any memory. So we right. think we are the avatar. And every experience that we can remember was an experience as this avatar. Now, when that avatar dies, that partition then starts to come down. It undoes the, the partition, <coughs> and we get reunited with the individuated unit of consciousness. Now, immediately after death, the consciousness will find itself in some other reality. You know, just like in the NDEs, the near-death experience. Mm -hmm. You know, they just find themselves in a, in a void someplace. And when they do, they begin to forget their past physical life, just like you tend to forget a dream. When you wake up after you're dreaming, immediately that dream is perfectly clear and vivid and then two minutes later it's not so clear anymore and 10 minutes later it's kind of hazy and if you think about it the next day it's just really vague it just disappears with time well that's what happens to your awareness of the life you just lived in the physical reality it just starts to fade like a dream right. and the partition comes down and you are now a part of your individuated unit of consciousness again, not just the little partitioned off free will awareness, free will awareness unit. So now you think about what are you going to do next? Because the whole reason you log on to these games is because you want to evolve the quality of your consciousness. That's what consciousness does. It, it evolves. So then you could do all sorts of things. You could, uh, you could have a, a kind of a review your life. You could look at all your past lives. You've had maybe thousands of past lives. And you'd look at all of that and say, well, you know, what are the trends here? You know, where, where are my big problems? Hmm. Well, I really need to work on anger management because I keep getting myself in big trouble because of flying <laughs> off the handle. And that's, a, that's an issue of mine. So, you know, I really would like to work on that. Maybe have a few successes where I don't get into rages. So maybe I want something simple next time where I don't have a lot of opportunity to do that or maybe i want a, a a more an easier incarnation who doesn't have so many uh challenges just so i can have a few successes and then i can slowly get you know get back to it with some successes under my belt but yeah. whatever it is you decide <laughs> then the system sets you up with something and then you go you go um, log on again and, and when you go log on your IUOC, individual unit of conscious, partitions off another piece just of its quality and it logs back on again. And so that cycle happens. 
So now in your consciousness and your avatar has just died, you start to lose the, like a dream, what you've been doing. And typically, depending on how much help you need, there is a system of another virtual reality that you kind of wake up in. Right. I call it the transition reality because people need a little help with the transition. And if it's a smooth, gentle transition, it works better than if it's a wham, you know, kind of transition. So first thing, let's say that you haven't evolved a whole lot. You're still a little iffy about things. You don't have a big picture. Then the first thing you'll probably see are people you know who are already have died. You know, Uncle Fred, maybe, maybe mom or maybe a sibling or somebody in your family. And they'll be smiling and waving at you. Oh, we've been expecting you, you know, come on over here. Yeah, yeah. And all of that <laughs> is, it's not really your family. It's just something that looks like your family enough to convince you that it is so that you relax and right. you let go. It's, a, it's, it's just a system created to let you de-stress from, and let you take yeah. some time to forget the past life Oh, no, I was right in the middle of something. What about my children? What about my wife? What about this? What about that? You know, and you can't you can need to kind of let that go and de-stress. It's disappearing like a dream. And then <clears throat> you run into this, the, the entities in this transition reality who make you feel welcomed and everything's OK. And it's all full of reassurance and you'll be fine. And, uh, you know, see that person over there go get in that line, you know, you can matriculate in, they'll have your name over there. And it's not that anybody really needs to do anything to matriculate in. This is all just busy work to keep, give people kind of some space in which these transitions can, they can kind of get used to the fact that, you know, things are different now. Mm. And <clears throat> you have free will always. So if you don't want another incarnation, you can always say no, and you don't have to. If you do want, then you can kind of order up what you'd like or take whatever they hand out or go to some other reality frame. You don't have to go back in this particular game. There's more games than this one out there, and you can go to some other reality game. But most of the times you don't. You like to stay in the game because you already know the ropes in this game. You've already been around it some. It's, you know, it's just easier. You know, it takes a while when you go to a new game to figure out what's yeah. going on and how to, yeah. you know, how to get along and how to, how to succeed. So typically people do come back here to this reality, but free will is yours. We all have free will mm. and we get to make that choice where we go, when, and how so that's kind of what it is when you die right. so you recycle and i didn't add that to my model because i thought reincarnation was a cool idea <laughs> or because the you know eastern philosophy thinks it's a cool idea but because it was a necessary function for consciousness consciousness is evolving it evolves by changing itself and lowering its entropy you can only do that through experience. You just don't lower your entropy by thinking about it. You have to lower your entropy within action, within doing. Yes. That's how you get it down to the being level. So in order to do that, in order to change fundamentally who you are is a hard thing. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to have more than one go at it. So the, I put, reincarnation actually in my books i don't call it reincarnation i tried to avoid all the words that were loaded with yeah sure you know don't religious know. stuff so i called it an experience packet right you need more more than one experience packet if you're going to evolve evolution is a whole series of tries right and evolution is a slow yeah tiny step by tiny step process so having one uh, <clears throat> one shot at going from uh, you know, daycare to graduate school, all in one leap, you know, is just too much to ask for. <laughs> You're not going to do that. So you have to have these multiple experience packets so that you can uh, evolve iteratively. All evolution is, a, is an iterative process. This has to be an iterative process as well. So it just logically was demanded that the experience packets be a part of the, the model.
So it wasn't that, like I say, it's not that I thought the Buddha had a great idea about reincarnation. It's because the model of consciousness otherwise doesn't work if you don't give it an opportunity to evolve. Yeah, yeah. And does that go on eternally or is there like some point of, once again, Eastern philosophy might call it enlightenment. Is there a point where we hit that and then we don't need to? No, not really. Right. That, uh, you know, we're trying to lower your entropy. You can never, well, two things about entropy. One is you can never get to zero entropy. You can get close. And in mathematics, they call that you can get asymptotic, which means you can approach it, but you can never actually get to zero entropy. And you can only lower your entropy by doing work, by putting effort in. If you just have any system and it just sits there and doesn't input any effort, the entropy will grow. Entropy naturally just happens. In other words, if you have order, that order will decay. That order will fall apart. Hmm. If you build a house and never do any maintenance, eventually your house will fall apart. Yeah. You know, whatever, you know, if you have a battery and it just sits on the shelf too long, eventually that battery will just not work anymore everything decays. So the nature of reality is if you don't put any effort into order, disorder just happens naturally, things break down, things decay. So you will always have to be trying to lower your entropy, you're always going to have to be working toward growing this, you're not going to get to a point where you're done, and don't have anything to do anymore. So you spend your days sitting on white puffy clouds playing harps, you know, that is not the way it's going to work. You have to constantly be working on it. Mm. Now, you don't have to constantly uh, return to the same you know, reality. You, know, you, you can go other places, do other things, but you do have to constantly be putting in effort and doing work. So evolution is a concept that's open-ended. Evolution doesn't have an endpoint. Evolution just, as long as there are new states to move into, then evolution just keeps on changing itself, modifying itself, growing, becoming. And we have so much room to grow that I don't see that we'll ever get to the point where there won't be any new growth states to go into, you know? So uh, I guess I should also say this consciousness system is not a super natural system. It's a natural system. It's finite. It's not infinite. It only has, you know, it has limited bits. It has limited energy or what we call energy, the ability to make changes. So it's a, it's just a real system, finite, and it's evolving. And we are piece part of that system. Wow. So that's, you know, there's, there's nothing, uh, there's nothing spooky about, uh, any yeah. of this it's it's just uh, basic science and the only assumptions that come in are that consciousness exists which isn't really such a dramatic assumption since we all feel like we're you know we're conscious we're we're aware awareness is here so just consciousness exists and then after that it's that uh, evolution exists and evolution is just if if you have a system that can change itself and if there are criteria toward its you know how it changes you know, that make a make it good change, evolutionary change as opposed to de-evolutionary changes, yeah. then it will change itself, you know, to better itself. So just with those two very basic assumptions, everything else is, is uh, just logic. And you mentioned there about like individuals putting effort in and doing the work. What would that look like, mm. specific exercises? Well, what it looks like is that it's the work you're doing is getting rid of fear. Okay. That's the fear and love are opposites. It's not love and hate. Hate's just a special condition of fear. It's fear and love. And one of them is, is fundamentally self-centered. That's the fear that one, the other is fundamentally other centered and that's love. So you have these, these two directions of high entropy toward fear and low entropy toward love. Okay, so what you're doing then is you're getting rid of fear. As you get rid of fear, if you got rid of all the fears you had, then you'd just be love. That's what would be left. 
Mm. So it's, it's a, uh, it's not so much like there's two separate things competing as it is that you have a potential to evolve and a potential to de-evolve. And the more fear you get rid of, the more your potential moves from de-evolution to evolution. So the thing, what you're doing is getting rid of fear. Well, what does that mean? It means being kind. It means caring. It means cooperating. It means helping. It means asking, you know, what can I do? Not what can I get? How can I help? Not, you know, what can I take? Um, it's just an attitude toward life, toward other people, towards yourself. Yeah. It's uh, very positive. Uh, about yourself, about others, anything negative, all the negative thoughts are the problem. So it's about being, being positive. So what do you do? You start being more positive. You start letting go of ne- when you find yourself getting upset or annoyed or aggravated or angry to stop, stop yourself and say, you know, that's not functional. This is not helping my life. This is why I'm miserable. It's because I feel this way. I feel angry. That makes me unhappy. Why do I feel angry? And you will find that the reason you feel angry is because of fear. That fear creates ego and it creates beliefs. So we're trying to get rid of all the beliefs we have. Beliefs are not helpful. You know, and I would tell all your viewers right now, don't believe anything I tell you. You know, belief is not the point. We want you to not believe anything. We want you to be skeptical of everything. This has, this, these ideas have to come to you from your own experience. Otherwise, if it's not your experience, it's not your truth, you might as well let it go. It's not going to do you any good. <clears throat> so if you find that you, let's say, get angry or, or feel annoyed, then ask yourself, why? Where does it come from? And you'll find first, it's, a, it's ego. Well, I don't want it that way. I, you know, I, I, everything it starts with I, I don't like that. I don't want that. That's not a good thing for me. And you'll realize that's your ego talking. Or, you know, it shouldn't be that way. Maybe that's your belief talking. And then you'll find that those, that ego and that belief are attached to a fear. The reason you have that ego is because you have fear. And the reason you have that belief is because you have fear. And then you have to get rid of that fear. And there's a couple of ways to do that. One is to, you know, get with the fear, connect to the fear, find out what it is. And if you can, if you do find its source, which you don't have to, but if you do find its source, you will find it's just smoke. There's nothing real there behind that fear. It's a belief Mm. that you have. It's just smoke. And then you can let go of it. And now you have this huge weight, you know, taken off of you. The rest of your life is so much easier. Then get rid of the next fear and the next fear and keep working on your fears till you get rid of them. And now you're a happy person. All your relationships are so much better with everybody, with your spouse, with your kids, with your boss, you know, relationships with coworkers and neighbors mm. are all a lot, so much better than they were. Your life is a lot happier. So that's how you do it. Look at the negative things. Those negative feelings are there because you have fear. If you didn't have fear, your life would be a life of joy and peace and satisfaction. So if that's not your life, then there's a lot of fear in there. Yeah. And for most people, there is a lot of fear in there. That's where we are. Like I say, this is maybe elementary school or preschool. Mm-hmm. You know, that's most of us are walking around mostly self-centered and mostly full of fear, full of ego and full of beliefs. Yeah. And we need to get rid of that stuff. And where do you start? Start with the negative feeling. That negative feeling will point to the problem, will point to the fear. You see, This is a philosophy that requires everybody to take responsibility for themselves. So you get angry, and instead of pointing at somebody else and saying, that person makes me angry, you have to take responsibility. Nobody can make you angry. You choose to be angry. It's because you have a fear. It's because you have ego and beliefs that you get angry. 
It's not that that person makes you angry. It's that person does something, and then you become angry, okay? And you take responsibility for that. That anger is mine, and I can get rid of it so that if that person says that rude thing to me, it doesn't make me angry. Matter of fact, I start having some compassion for that person because I know that kind of rudeness is coming from their pain. You see, so it just changes the perspective around entirely. So, you know, what do you do to get rid of the fear? Start with the negative feelings you have. Get rid of every one of them. And don't, don't think you're changing behavior. You're not. You're changing who you are. You're changing being. So it's not that you want to act more kind. You want to be more kind. You want to be more cooperative, not just act more cooperative. Yeah, yeah. Acting isn't the point. Being is the point. You only evolve by changing who you are. You don't evolve by being a good actor. So you can act kind and act cooperative and smile all the time and still not evolve at all because inside you've got all this fear and anger and other negativity that's just boiling in there. You're just stuffing it all under the rug and not showing it. So you have to actually change who you are, and that's why you can't do it easily. It's not a simple task to change who you are. That's a, that takes a lot, of, uh, a lot of effort and a lot of trials and a lot of tribulation you have to go through. Yeah. And you just have to go through it. The good news is it's not a time test. Mm. You know, take as long as you like. Mm. The bad news is you don't get any points for trying. You only get points for success. You have to let go of the fear. So if it takes you a thousand lifetimes to get over you know, your anger problem, well, it'll take you a thousand lifetimes to do that. If you can do it in one lifetime, well, okay, now you can move on to other things. So take as long as you need. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, um, the, the time is, is not infinite, but it's open-ended. Yeah. You take as long as you need. So then you kind of see ourselves as, should I just be wandering cluelessly around in the playing field and having no idea really what I'm doing here? What is my purpose? You know, what's the point of life? Or should I understand the game, realize what the purpose is and the point, and get to work in you know, winning, being a part of this game, doing the things that you know, I'm here to do? And one way you feel miserable and happy and the other way you feel contentment and peace and satisfaction and joy. So it's a pretty simple choice. I yeah. think between which one of those paths you'd like to be on is, is kind of a no brainer. Yeah. Yeah. Tom, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed talking to you. It's uh, it's been a pleasure. I've been nearly an hour and a half, I think. So uh, we'll begin to wrap this up. Can people find your work anywhere? I know you're probably on Amazon and everything is anywhere else people can uh, look you yeah. up. Well, you can find the books on Amazon and any bookstore and can order them if they don't have them. But I also have them on Google Books for free. Oh, cool. So if you just like to take a, lot, a look, you like to save the money, they're not that expensive. I have them pretty cheap. But uh, if you want to look first, then go to Google Books and you can find my big toe there and you can read the whole trilogy uh, for free. Now, I also have a lot of videos on YouTube and oh, probably uh, over a thousand hours of videos. So when you first go there, it's going to be a little intimidating. You know, you're going to find a seven or 800 different videos and most of them are going to be like an hour and a half long or something like that. That kind of, kind of tough to, to, you know, get yourself to sit down in front of something that that long. But just do them slowly, a little bit at a time, because YouTube will save where you left off. You can come back a week later and hit the, you know, go to that, that particular thing, and YouTube will put you right back at where you stopped. So you can, uh, you can do them over a longer period of time. But there's a lot of information there. Everything that I do, I try to take video of it and then put it up on YouTube so it's mm. for free. So the courses I do, you know, I, I do some courses and things that, uh, uh, you know, I charge money because there's venues and <clears throat> that sort of thing. But I try to videotape all of them and then put the videos up for free. So you can pretty much look at all of my paid events. You just can't ask the question live because you're looking at a video. That's the, that's the only thing that's really 
different about it, but those are all up there. <coughs> it's um, just go to YouTube and put in what the www.youtube.com slash TWCJR44. TWCJR44 okay. and hit go and that will take you to that site. Or you can go to my website, which is www.mybigtoe.com and that will take you to a website and you'll be able to click on the YouTube videos from there. Cool. If you want, my website will tell you a bit about me and what's going on. If you want to know about events I'm doing, uh, go to uh, MBT events, www.mbt events, MBT for my big toe. That's my event planners. Those are the people that put on all my events. So they'll have a lot of pages and stuff for you to browse around there. So that's all the general places. Of course, I've got books on, I got the uh, places on social media that you can, that you can find if you wish, but I don't ever go there. It's, <laughs> I, I sometimes drop in every once in a while, but social media is not my thing. Yeah. I don't, I don't do a whole lot there, but I have other people that do other people who run that site for me. There's also a, uh, a forum that's now almost two decades old that, uh, uh, has lots of places to ask questions and get answers. There's a lot of smart people there who who know a lot about it, and you can generally get good answers that's there. Okay. So that's all the things if you want to find out more about it. Okay, I'll put those in the show notes. So uh, thanks for sharing them. Tom, it's been an absolute pleasure and an honor. So uh, thanks for coming on. You're welcome. You're welcome, Alex. Um, you know, knowledge is a really uh, great thing, but shared knowledge is even better. Yeah. So I have an opportunity with you to, to share some with other people, and I appreciate that. So Cheers, thank Tom. you for inviting me on. Thank you very much. Have a good one. Okay. So long. Thank you. Bye-bye.